All right. Um, I'm David Murphy. I am uh, the Director of Research and Development for Seabird Scientific, and uh, we're going to be discussing the SUNA in situ nitrate sensor theory and operation. I anticipate we'll, uh, we'll run about two hours with a break in the middle, and thank you all for getting up early. Well, thank the three of you for getting up early and, uh, and coming in to, to see the presentation. Uh, in addition to myself, we have Ian Walsh here with us. Uh, he's a senior oceanographer at Seabird Scientific and also has is perhaps a little more experience than I do in, in using the SUNA. And so if you have questions uh, either, either after the presentation or during the week, uh, please feel free to, to uh, either come by our booth or if you see us out and about, don't be afraid to pull us aside and, uh, and talk to us about SUNA. So the structure of the workshop is going to be, uh, I'm going to describe the SUNA, I'm going to talk about, about the various pieces and parts and some discussion of our, our assumptions and uh, a lot of time on setup and operation. Then we'll take a break and uh, work into theory of operation where we'll talk about some of the foundations of, of uh, sensing nitrate with a SUNA. And then finally, we'll discuss a data example from Puget Sound. This one is a, is a profiling uh, example and it includes some validation samples that were taken in addition to the, to the SUNA profiles. So first off, um, there are, well, here is, the, here is the diagram of the SUNA that you see, and I also happen to have one up here with me. And so, actually, first off, how many of you are own SUNAs and are actively deploying and using them? All three of you. Okay, good. So I won't spend a lot of time waving that around, uh, but I will point out that... Uh, there's two path lengths, different path lengths, the path length being here the distance that the, between the, uh, the light source and the receiver that, that is where the action actually occurs. And it's a fairly simple thing. It's got a light source here on this end and then a detector and receiver on this end. There is the is the sample path, much like a cuvette and a spectrophotometer. And then for, uh, for more time series applications, you can equip the SUNA with a bio wiper. Um, there's the end cap, the bulkhead connector. And the, uh, the range that we can operate over here, it's expressed in milligrams of, of nitrogen per liter, so we can go from 0.056 to 556, um, it will, there are uh, interfering or, or additional signals for CDOM and turbidity that you can, can uh, try to make estimates of using the SUNA. However, I'll show you an example in the, in the uh, field in the last part of the discussion where there's a, a clear uh, spike in the nitrate signal that doesn't really make sense in relation to the validation work, but perhaps could be ascribed to a CDOM from a larvacean uh, bloom. Um, the, of course, the one centimeter path length offers you higher accuracy because you double the amount of material that is in the, between the light source and the, and the detector. And, um, Another point that I wanted to make is that we're working in the ultraviolet range, and so the light source for the SUNA is a deuterium lamp. It's actually a light bulb. It draws quite a bit of power, takes a little bit of time to warm up, and the light source has a finite length a lifetime to it, and so the hours that the light is on are monitored throughout your SUNA use to make sure that you don't deploy with a, a light bulb that's about to, to expire. Um, 
I mentioned that we have a, a wiper for the Suna, and you can see there it's a bristly brush on a copper stem, and it sweeps the entire length of the path back and forth. Uh, you can set it up to, to uh, either wipe or not, depending upon what you want to do, and then uh, every time you take a sample, the bio wiper sweeps through and cleans off any accumulation of gunk that might have got, got down in there. So RS-232 is standard communication for the SUNA. We, uh, we also have a USB connection for it as well. The, uh, the USB is used primarily to transfer files. It's much faster than the serial output is, and you do get full operation or capability with USB. Uh, typically people will, will use the RS-232 in the field uh, because it's a little easier to get connected up. And then there's also an analog output that you can use with, uh, with other logging, data loggers, uh, other CTDs, and uh, an SDI-12 if you are one of the agencies that, use that, that uses that older addressable interface. You power the SUNA with 8 to 18 volts. Um, if you have the wiper, 18 volts is going to overpower the wiper, so you should should uh, dial it down to about 15 volts. And you can see that there is some uh, real differences in the current draw. So on standby mode, when, it's, when the system is up and idling, it's drawing about 20 milliamps at 12 volts. However, when it's sampling, it's all the way up to 650 milliamps. And the reason for that is that deuterium light bulb. And like all light bulbs, it draws quite a bit of power compared to uh, to LEDs that you often find in other equipment. And so because of that, that, that does limit the, the uh, compatibility for the SUNA for some of the smaller CTD products and data loggers. The, uh, your, your system has to be able to source at least uh, 650 milliamps, which is quite a bit. Uh, there's an external battery pack that you can equip the SUNA with if your system doesn't, can't source that much current. SUNA has two gigabytes of internal memory and if you're taking a sample every 15 minutes you would be able to work for about 34 years to fill up the card so so there's plenty of memory there. Uh, if you took of course 10 frames every 15 minutes then it would take you about a tenth that time to fill up your your memory, but there's, there is plenty of memory there, and all of the scans are stored on there as, as CSV files, and uh, they're all essentially text, comma delimited text, even though some of them have different extents, and we'll go through the files that, that are useful to your analysis. So we have a user interface, and uh, it's called UCI. Um, I'm not sure what is user. I'm not sure what what UCI stands for. User common interface. Uh, user common interface. So we we are moving to this interface for all Seabird scientific products. I think is the eventual goal. And so as the as the uh, as the newer products come out, we'll adapt them to this interface. So hopefully gain some commonality that will help our customers work through our equipment. But. What you see when you, when you run the UCI is, is shown here on the screen, and there, is, there are dashboards that allow you to operate the instrument, data tabs that show you what's, be, what's going on with the instrument, a real-time plot. There's several different, different tabs that show different parameters uh, that will scroll across your screen in real-time, and then there's some... some uh, file handling information down here. So when you cable up to your SUNA and you, uh, you f first run UCI, you, you need to um, get connected up to the instrument. And as I said, we're supporting several different instruments with the software. As soon as you, you uh, run the UCI software, what you see is the opportunity to select the instrument 
and the COM port. So you would pick SUNA as your instrument, and then if you know which COM port it is, it's, they're all uh, will be uh, enumerated here, and you can pick one and then click connect, which is this button down here that you can't quite see. So what happens next is that the software begins to pull the SUNA, whether it's the serial port or the USB port, looking for, looking for the SUNA, and uh, it will also cycle through all of the baud rates that the SUNA supports hunting for it. And then finally, when it, uh, when it makes contact, it turns the light here from from uh, searching for the SUNA to connected to the SUNA, and then it fills out this table that gives you information about, about the uh, current state of the SUNA. And then finally, the dashboard has got a whole set of buttons that you can use, uh, use for setup. And then, yes, this is much better. Okay. So, Here's your status information, tells you what port you're connected to and that you're in setup mode, uh, how much lamp time available. Remember that we talked about, about the lamp and its life cycle, or its lifetime, and so there are, are about a thousand hours of lamp time available uh, per light bulb, and it's tracked on board the SUNA every time the light turns on, the, uh, the time is, is noted. Uh, shows you how much is available on the SD card and also what the SUNA clock is set to. Uh, it operates in, uh, here we're operating in, in uh, UTC time. And then finally your serial number and revision date. So this controls your communication with the SUNA. You can either connect or disconnect and once you're connected this changes from connect to disconnect which is intuitive and then there is uh, modes of operation for the SUNA, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, you can also update the, uh, the reference, which we're going to go into how you would, would do that. This, is, this involves putting a known solution. In this case, we're going to use uh, deionized water in the, in the uh, presentation, and then measuring the spectrum. Uh, when we talk about the the uh, theory of operation will discuss how the different components of the spectrum are used to, to compute a nitrate value. And then finally, oops, oh, wrong button, crap. And then finally, uh, you can move files back and forth from this, that are stored in the SUNA to your local directory on your PC. You can operate the wiper while you can have it out there on the bench and see that it's going to go. And there's a command terminal if you want to type to the SUNA directly. And then you can also uh, look at archive data on the real-time display. The UCI has a real-time graphical display that you can play back data on. So the uh, SUNA dashboard is, is here. You, if you click on... SUNA settings, you get the SUNA dashboard, which you see here, and you pick the mode of sampling that you want. So that's continuous, periodic, fixed time, polled, and SDI-12 are your choices, as I mentioned before. And then you also set up sample interval and offset. Uh, a word about sample interval, that is the SUNA's clock is set to be, it's a 24-hour clock, and you set up the sample interval by picking the hour that you would like to sample on and the offset of the time. So, for example, if you wanted to, to sample at midnight every day and, your, uh, and your, you wanted to sample at midnight and, or 15 minutes after midnight, you would set the sample interval to be 0, 0, 0 for midnight, and then an offset of uh, 15 times 60 seconds, or uh, I can't do math and talk at the same time. <laughs> anyway, you set it for hours and seconds. So if you wanted it to sample at, at 6 in the morning, you would pick 6 and so many seconds to offset. I believe that's correct. Then there is 
uh, measurements to average, so you can take ensembles and store an average of those. There's uh, an estimate of how long it will take you to collect your data, so the data rate is essentially shown here for your ensemble. You can choose to use the wiper or not. And then there's also a log file that's collected, and there's, there's degrees of verbosity, the amount of information that you want to put into it. So for continuous mode, you uh, can either, it, it will either start on power up or auto run, or you can use the, the SUNA dashboard to start it up. giving it start and stop commands. Um, don't forget to, to enable your wiper if you're doing time series measurements. And as I mentioned in the last slide, there's different levels of, uh, of diagnostic and verbosity that are, are included in the log file. Um, you can change this, but, but our customer support team recommends that you, you stick with the uh, Seabird default levels so that they know what to expect in your log file and have an easier time helping you out. So periodic mode, um, as I mentioned, the, the sample interval is one hour, so, so, well, here's an example here, two hours, so you set this to be how many hours you want, and it will sample on the even hour. And if you want to offset it, in this example, it's offset 10 minutes. And so in, in well, the, <laughs> the slide and the, uh, and the text don't quite match. So were you to set for 15 seconds, it would sample at, at 15 minutes after midnight, 15 minutes after 2, et cetera. So hopefully that's clear. Should I, uh, should I run through that one more time since I kind of garbled it? So sample interval is set here for an hour, and you can offset by the number of seconds. So this would sample every hour and 10 minutes. In this example, two-hour sampling with no offset gives you every two hours around the clock. And then three-hour interval with 900 seconds gives you a sample every three hours around the clock offset by 15 minutes. So you can also operate in fixed time, and that works just like continuous, except it only takes one sample for a predetermined amount of time. So you could have it wake up at a particular time of day and sample for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and then that would create your ensemble average and give you your data point. Um, we also offer polled modes. So if you have a, a data logger that can query the SUNA, you can, you, it will sleep until you wake it up and then you request a sample and it will go through its, its operation and then uh, output the sample to, to your logging system. Um, SDI 12 operates much the same way. This is, uh, is, a, is essentially a poll mode that is addressable. So you can have several SDI devices on the, on the system and, and pull them uh, in series. And then we also uh, offer this, this uh, product for use in, in uh, Ape Ar Argo floats, which Argo is a large international program. And uh, although it's not necessarily pertinent to this discussion, you can also equip floats with it. And then there is a float mode for, for that system, and that's essentially a poll mode, too, where, the, where, like the others, the SUNA waits for you to wake it up and request a sample. Um, so here's an important message that if you are waking it up and communicating with it via the RS-232 port, you have to cycle power to put it back into its, its periodic or pulled mode state. Uh, otherwise, it will stay in serial operation. Essentially, it's like it stays in setup mode until you cycle the power, and then it goes back to its, its time, its, 
It's predetermined operating mode. Here's the telemetry tab on the SUNA settings dashboard. Uh, here you get the usual things. You get baud rate, you get frame format. You can pick between ASCII and binary. Um, given the large memory available in modern computers, I, I don't know why you would choose binary since you can't look at the files, but it is there for you if you have a less capable system that you're working with. And uh, the data logging does have impact on the, uh, on the file creation and how the files are stored in the memory. Um, if you set it up for daily here, then SUNA will create a new file every day, which is pretty easy to, to understand. This is, this is a typical operating mode for time series operation. Uh, you can also create a new file every time the SUNA, SUNA starts sampling. And remember, one of the sampling modes, it will awaken at a predetermined time and sample for an interval that you've set. And so in that case, you get a new file every time it woke up and, and took a sample. And then you can also choose to change files by size. So if you want your files to be in, in 512 kilobyte blocks, you can, you can set that up too. And it's, it's size given in megabytes here. And then here is your SDI-12 address, too, if you, if you happen to be a, uh, somebody who uses that system. Uh, and then there are advanced settings. Um, I suggest that you, that unless you consider yourself an a expert user, that you accept these defaults. If you, if you change these, it's going to be, make it harder for customer support to to help you understand your data. Also, uh, a lot of the processing algorithms are very much tailored to a specific section of the spectrum, and we'll talk about the spectrum and what parts we're using a little later in the discussion. But the processing algorithms are keyed into a particular part of the spectrum, and if you change the, the range that you're looking at, then the performance of the, of the algorithms is, is going to be affected. So. We do suggest that you leave these alone. Uh, you can also change the integration period. So integration period, it, it, it is how long the light bulb is on and how long detector readings are collected and then averaged to produce your scan. So again, this is kind of an ensemble average idea. Um, these are used for the digital to analog converter. This. Uh, it, I, I mentioned that it does have an analog output, making it compatible with, uh, with older data collection systems that aren't able to accept the serial data stream. And you, oops. And you can range these, as you see here, to, to set up the, like, 0 to 5 volts equals, equals a nitrate range of 0 to 100 micromole per liter. And then if you're working in conditions of high turbidity or CDOM, then you can increase your, your integration time or your ensemble time to try to tease out a better nitrate calculation. And we'll talk about these uh, interfering substances uh, uh, later in the course and at the, or later in the workshop. And then at the, at the last uh, data example that we have, we'll, we'll look at some, uh, some of these signals and talk about how to measure them. And then you also have to uh, tell the software whether you're working in fresh water or salt water. And we'll also talk about that a little in more in detail. But um, the way that the data for the student is processed is you, you collect a sample spectrum and then you have reference spectrums. And you have a reference spectrum that is deionized water. And so you use the difference between these to tease out the nitrate absorbance. If you're working in fresh water, the absorbance of fresh water is different than the absorbance of seawater. And so you, if you work in seawater, then you remove the, the zero nitrate seawater absorbance from your sample signal to calculate nitrate. So you have to, you have to tell the software whether you, which, uh, which spectrum you want to use as your reference or your zero nitrate 
value. Here is the file management dashboard, and so you click on uh, this one, this button here that says transfer files, it's, and then this shows you what is stored on board the SUNA, and here is what it finds in your local PC directory. Uh, you browse to point to the, to the folder you're interested in, and then you highlight files and click the arrow here, and it will move them from the SUNA onto your, your uh, computer. Similarly, data files are, are the, pre the previous version was, was log files, and so here it is again for data files. And these are all collected as ASCII text files with comma-separated values, so you can easily import them into Excel or MATLAB or something like that that you, that you like to work with. And again, as I, as I mentioned before, the files are, are, are created and logged either by event file size or by calendar daily, depending upon what you picked in the telemetry tab, and then you, uh, you move them to, the, to your local PC. So log files uh, also comma-separated values, and this, these contain information about the about the SUNA itself and some of its operating parameters that if you were going to uh, try to look into it and see how the lamp was doing, how the, the, uh, the detector was doing, the, that those, some of those engineering values are stored in the log file. And you would, if you were having a problem, you would contact customer support and they very likely would request copies of these files. So there's lamp use and system log. These are the two files that are, are uh, stored on board and just appended to continuously. And then finally, calibration files. So you end up and <clears throat> you can end up having quite a few calibration files on board the SUNA and the reason for that is each time you update the reference spectrum which we're going to talk about further in this pres little further down in this presentation. Each time you you collect a new reference spectrum, it uh, adds a a letter designator to the serial number of the SUNA, and then creates a new calibration file. So when you process your data to nitrate cal nitrate concentration, you use the calibration file and your data file to end up to run through the calculation and come up with a nitrate in uh, micromoles per liter or milligrams. You have a choice in a couple of different units. So here's what real-time data looks like. Again, this is running the, the UCI interface, and <coughs> I collected these data on the, on, uh, the bench at my desk, and so you select a time series. You can d display up to three different time series, and so I have, this is the nitrate in micromoles that I'm displaying, and it's very close to zero, which I hope it would be because we are in air on my desk. And then here are the absorbents at 254 nanometers and 350 nanometers, which are the the uh, extra wavelengths that are recorded to help understand uh, interference by CDOM or turbidity. I was curious about these, and so that's why I was looking at them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that further in the course. But you, you cable up to your SUNA, get it set up to run in continuous mode, and then the button here, it's running now, so the button says stop, but were it idling, then this would be your start button, so you would click this, data would begin to scroll across the screen, uh, the plot's auto range, and so the, the plot gets more and more and more compressed as you go. All right. And then there's also a tabular display. You can choose whether you, what, which units you like, and you can choose them on the fly. Uh, the 
units are displayed, they're not, it's, it's a, a volatile display. The, the actual raw data that the night calculations are made from, of course, is logged. And so you can switch as often as you want down here. And then if you, you can also get, uh, you can add more columns to this and you can get some statistical information about the, uh, about the calculations you're making. And then finally, there is the last tab. Again, I apologize for the blurry slides here. And this is uh, what is in the log file. And so you can uh, choose some, some uh, you can make some selections that, in, that indicate how exactly you're going to store the files and what the nomenclature is for the, for the file naming. And then there's an auto logging feature if you would like to change whether you capture them in separate files or they're appended to at the time of data collection. And so here's what the spectral plots look like. Um, you can see that we, we collect data over a, quite a wide range from about 200, na well from 200 roughly nanometers to out to 400 and, uh, and this is the absorbance of the sample that was in the soon at the time. Uh, one thing about the, the wavelength range is that inside the SUNA is a, is a Zeiss spectrophotometer and the actual wavelengths of each bin of data, so imagine that it's, it's, uh, it's a light source coming into a spectrophotometer, the spectrophotometer splits the light source and there's a photodiode array that collects the absorbance at each one of these wavelength bins and the actual wavelength of each bin in nanometers is, is measured by Zeiss and is unique to that particular spectrophotometer. Now, mind you, we're talking unique in the terms of a of, uh, couple of decimal places difference, spectrophotometer to spectrophotometer, but the exact wavelength that you get it depends on that spectrophotometer. So you might have a bin at 208.5 nanometers and you might find a spectrophotometer later that has it at 208.4. And so, although that's, it doesn't impact your measurement, it's, it's, uh, it's how the spectrophotometer is made. And then there's also an offset value here as well. So where exactly you start, whether it's 206, 208, is also something that's supplied with that spectrophotometer. And you'll see that in some of the, some of the log files. Well... Here's the plot again, uh, same one we were looking at a few moments ago. Uh, you can scale it across the top here. There's zoom in, zoom out. If you get lost, you can click on auto range and it will snap it back into view. Uh, you can change either time or range. You can click this and switch back to the default. Again, much like auto range, it'll bring it back into view. And then if you don't like it uh, with a white background, you can click on the the dark scheme and it will show you the whole plot only it'll be on a black background rather than a white. And then you can elect to show just lines or, or also the data plots, in, the data points individually. So mounting. Uh, <laughs> some things are, are fairly obvious. Don't use your if your SUNA is equipped with a bio wiper, don't use that as a handle, even though it's, it's very convenient to do that. Uh, you can use hose clamps, but the pressure housing, particularly for the shallow product, is, uh, is not very thick. And so you should take care that you, if you hose clamp, that you don't force the SUNA, the housing to go out of round. And if you do that, then the O-rings won't work as well as they should, or if at all and you can cause the unit to flood by over-tightening a hose clamp on the, on the body of the SUNA. Uh, it is aluminum and anodized, so you need to be very careful about dissimilar metals contacting each other. If you have stainless steel hose clamps and you clamp right onto the body of the SUNA, then you're likely going to cause pitting and corrosion. So we use Teflon tape 
at Seabird when we, when we do this. Um, we can supply that to you if you would like some. It's pretty thick and robust, but you can simply use electrical tape to protect the housing as well. The point is to try to keep uh, them from making electrical contact. Um, ideally, you would mount it on a flat surface. Uh, here's some of the different clamping devices that we can supply if you want to attach it to a round housing or a flat uh, cage or something like that. And then here's an example where there's two point mounting, one near the top of the Suna and one near the bottom with the, uh, with the sample area being right in the middle. Uh, so because of the way that the Suna is set up with its light path, you can see looking down the Suna, there's a large cavity here here and then a fairly small area that allows a pass-through of wires and such. But that means that this point on the Suna is, is uh, not fragile, but it's, it's a weak point in the, in the whole housing part. And if you, if you mount them in such a way that, the, that there's force on the Suna on the long axis, that would be this way across the Suna, then it's possible that you can, can flex the Suna to the point where you will damage the housing. And this is, this is one that came back from, uh, from the field. And you can see that the, I don't, I don't know whether it, was in, whether it was waves or currents that did this, but it pushed the housing to the point where it parted right here and the whole thing flooded and was, was uh, lost. So two point mountings are good. Uh, be aware that there is that, that narrow point in the middle of the instrument that, that is uh, not as robust as the rest of it. So you can update reference spectra uh, in the field, and it's a good idea to do this before and after you deploy so that you have this like a pre and post calibration. The reference spectra is... Uh, is used to calculate nitrate and it is the absorbance of zero nitrate sample essentially. So if you're working in seawater you use you you would collect zero nitrate seawater spectra. If you're working in fresh water you would use deionized water for this. And so with the example that we're going to talk about we're we're going to use deionized water. So here's the stuff you need your SUNA, you need a power supply to turn the thing on and operate the lamp, uh, some deionized water, Kim wipes, Q-tips, things like that. Because what we're going to do is we're going to clean the, clean the windows carefully, measure the reference spectra, compare it to the previous reference spectra that have been recorded, and do it again if we don't like what we see until we get a reference spectra that is a reasonably good match to the last one, which will Assuming the last one, the windows were nice and clean, will tell you that you're that you are uh, ready to go. Um, so there's the list of, of stuff. So first thing you do is you clean your window, and um, don't use abrasive pads, of course. Uh, aggressive cleaning compounds or metal tools, it is an optical window. So the goal is to clean it off completely, but not to damage it or change its optical properties in any way. You should use lint-free wipes. We use uh, Kim wipes at Seabird. And <clears throat> here again, the, the object is to get an optically clean window, no lint, no particles on board. And then you uh, use the software that we provide to update the reference spectra. Um, you should use only fresh deionized water and you should store it in glass. So we've, I've mentioned several times that, that there are interfering substances and uh, dissolved organic matter is one of them. And so if you store your water in plastic bottles, they tend to, to uh, leak hydrocarbons into the water, and hydrocarbons are dissolved organic matter, particularly plasticizers. I think phthalates are very common in, in uh, water that's stored in plastic bottles. People 
people are concerned about this for their drinking water as well. And so where you see notes that this particular water bottle will not leach this particular organic compound, that's what we're talking about, only the SUNA is more sensitive than you or I are. And so always store your calibration solutions and your reference solutions in glassware rather than plastic. And then it says, as it says, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to tape around the, around the sample path so it will hold our reference water and then we're going to fill it and make sure that we don't get any bubbles inside. So here it suggests that you use parafilm. Uh, you can also use tape. Um, it warns you not to use cups or buckets and that's because we're trying for a, a very clean, quiet sample in there. So after you, you um, recover your SUNA, you of course should clean the area around the sensing path, uh, and you need a large enough area around, this, around the, the, this part, the sample path, so that you can essentially make a waterproof seal around here with parafilm or tape, because you're going to fill this cavity with your reference solution. So you wrap it with with parafilm and you fill it with deionized water after you have carefully rinsed it to make sure that it's free of salt water and loose debris. Connect up to your SUNA and put it into continuous mode. That was what I showed you a few slides ago. Um, and log 60 seconds worth of data. So this is your practice run or your dirty read. So you can record your observations and then you stop the SUNA, take off the parafilm, and discard your sample. And now it's time for the real thing. So you carefully clean the pathway and the optics with deionized water, soft nylon plastic brushes, and uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, if, if it's, we suggest that if you have oysters, barnacles, mussels, in that sample pathway that you can use something as aggressive as vinegar. Uh, don't use any, any hard acids, no hydrochloric acids or anything like that. But vinegar is usually pretty effective in removing this. And then also, if you do have to get in there and scrape around, do it very carefully with plastic tools so that you don't, that you don't mar the optic surface. So then log another 60 seconds and see how it's changed from your your dry run up here, create a fresh sample and do it again, and then you, you uh, finally, once you have a stable spectra, then record it with the SUNA software. So the, as you're going to see in a few minutes, you can collect these reference uh, runs and compare them with the software. So it, although it doesn't really call that out here, you, you get a visual display of your your run compared to the last run, so you can see that you are that you are getting it clean and getting a good um, getting a good spectrum. So first off, does it read between spec? If the answer is yes, then you've succeeded. And reading within spec is 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 uh, there's a visual display that shows you this. And then if you're not within spec, keep going until you can achieve a, a, a reference spectrum that is about 10, is repeating to within about 10% over this, this wavelength range. So it seems like it's pretty simple, but as you get in there and try to do it, you'll discover that, that cleaning a window to a, a state of, of complete optical cleanliness is not as easy as you think. Um, something that you should be aware of is that if you buy rubbing alcohol or some lower grades, some technical grades of isopropyl alcohol, there are uh, manufacturing byproducts that are dissolved in it, they're oils. And so you should be very careful in using these. Use a high quality uh, reagent grade or, or something similar, isopropyl alcohol, so that you don't end up leaving these byproducts of manufacturing behind on the window. Um, there are situations where you just can't get the window completely clean and it becomes very difficult to get a good, a good reference measurement and in that case you should 
should get in there and, and uh, work a little harder with your Q-tips and your, your um, Kim wipes. Um, again, vinegar can help if there happens to be little particles or parts on there that you can't rub off. And you don't be afraid to contact support to off ask for advice. The guys are there uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, and so you can call in and tell them how you're doing and they'll advise you when to, when to get a little more aggressive. Uh, if you take the wiper off, that's certainly a reasonable thing that you can do, but be care that, take care that you don't bend it or move it. And you also need to note the wiper misalignment before you remove it and make sure you get it back in the same place. Otherwise, as you might imagine, it won't wipe properly because it won't be in the right orientation. So then you update your calibration file. And you do that by going to the uh, Zuna settings. And there's a reference update wizard. So it tells, gives you all of the steps to fill the volume with DI water, acquire the spectra, and then compare the new reference spectrum to the current one. And this is what you do to make sure that you're getting a good reference reading is you make this comparison. And then you update the calibration file that's stored on board the Suna. So after you've filled your sample, vo sample volume, then the wizard tells you that it's acquiring data. You click back and next, just like any wizard, to go back and forth. And so we're processing the acquiring and processing the new spectra. And then here is what the display that informs you of a percent change. So what ideally you would do is you would, you would see some difference from the reference spectra that was stored in the SUNA with the one that you are, are measuring here, and you would hope that this, this would be consistent and repeatable run to run when you, look, when you have a good one that's a few percent different from your existing one, then you can accept that and upload the calibration file. And again, we look for nice smooth lines, so you should have a, a monotonic uh, continuous difference in the spectrum. So then you finally update it, the end, and you can choose where to store your CAL file locally and you, it will automatically be put into the SUNA for you, but you can archive it on your PC. And then the finish button creates reports, does the upload, uh, if you decide you've, you've, you're not confident about what you've, you've done, you can revert to the, to the old spectrum at any time uh, by simply transferring the other ones back using the file manager. That's a good reason to archive your, your spectra so that you can go back to that if you need to. And then you get a calibration report um, where it shows you the reference spectrum that you've actually collected, the difference between the reference spectrum that you have, have created and the previous one you were using, and then a table of values for, for that particular reference spectra. And then if you want to, you can look at, at different calibration files that you have recorded, and uh, these are compared here on, the, on that tab. So that takes us to the end of the first section in setup and operations. Do we have any, do you guys have any questions? Theory of operation will review the Beer-Lambert law and talk a little bit about superposition of absorbent spectra. Uh, we'll talk about background spectra a bit, uh, some of temperature and salinity sensitivity and then walk through the steps of calculating nitrate. So first off, uh, the Beer-Lambert law. The, the SUNA is an a, uh, absorbance uh, meter, and so it follows the Beer-Lambert law, then, and your measurement is, is, depends upon path length and optical density of the material that you're working with. So, Here's a picture of Lambert, and unfortunately, well, 
or whatever. Uh, there is no, I could not find a picture of Beer, so I don't think anyone knows what Beer looks like anymore. He's lost to the world. But at least we have Lambert. And so it's, it's a pretty basic uh, process. You have a light source. In our case, it's a deuterium uh, lamp that, that emits in the UV spectra. You have a sample, and you beam light through the sample, and the sample absorbs some of the light, and so the transmitted light then is, is, uh, is impinges upon a detector, and the transmitted light is proportional to the absorbance by the material. So what we do in this, in this process is we measure the transmission of, uh, of reference material, either uh, deionized water or, and uh, zero nitrate seawater. And then we use that as our, as our, our baseline or our blank, and then the seawater or freshwater samples while you're out working, are, uh, the transmitted light is measured directly, and that is proportional to the nitrate concentration in your sample. So it's additive. And this diagram, which is really kind of scary if you, uh, if you think about it, is all of the various constituents in natural waters that absorb in the UV range that we are interested in. So you can see there's spectra for bromine, which is one of our primary interfering uh, species that we correct for by, by knowing the salinity and the temperature of the water that we're working in. And then, but there's also uh, iodine, hydrogen sulfide, uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, and then H2S down here. And so here's nitrate, the blue curve down here that you see at the very bottom. And so the, the, the challenge in, uh, in teasing out a nitrate concentration from all of these spectra is that you've got all of this going on and it's additive in terms of the spectra that you see. So you combine all of these in whatever concentrations they're present to get the, uh, to get <coughs> this. <coughs> um, another point that I have, have not uh, talked much about is that, that there is another species of, of uh, nitrogen, nitrite. And so nitrate is NO3, nitrite is NO2. Uh, it's a different, just a different ion of of the uh, of the same uh, material, but it has the same absorbance spectrum that nitrate does. And so, what we're really measuring is nitrate plus nitrite. Nitrite is a, a physiological byproduct of plant activities, and so it's typically either not present or it's present in very low quantities. So we essentially consider nitrite to be uh, negligible in all of our calculations. Now, if you're working with wet chemistry using a, a flow analyzer, auto analyzer, something like that, you will typically measure nitrate and nitrite and then report the two and, and subtract them to get the true value of, of nitrate uh, with a cadmium reduction column. We don't have that luxury with our much more compact instrument, and so we just lump nitrate and nitrate, nitrite together. So we, <clears throat> to get the spectrum that you see in the plot here, we measure the absorption of uh, the sample or the calibration material, and then we subtract off the dark counts. So the, at, for uh, time series measurements, the SUNA will measure the detector output with the lamp off for the integration period that you've chosen, and then it will measure, turn the lamp on, and will measure the sample absorbance, again, for the integration period that you have selected, and it will subtract the two to come up with, with this spectrum that you see here. And so the part of the spectrum that we're using is 217 nanometers up to about 240, this area right, right here. So the process is you measure the spectra, you subtract the dark counts, you uh, subtract the absorption of your blank, your seawater blank, if you're working in seawater, 
to, that is, this is measured in calibration. You make an estimate of bromine from the temperature and the salinity of the water. You remove that, and then you end up with a multivariate equation that you can solve by a variety of means. We at Seabird Scientific use a multivariate least squares method. Um, you can find these in, in MATLAB. Uh, you can probably find Python scripts, and so it's, it's, it's not an uncommon statistical process that there's, there's code samples for that you can find. So just to illustrate what we're, what we're working with, um, <clears throat> here is a seawater sample. Actually, I'm sorry, I think these are fresh water. So here is, a, here is a natural water sample that does contain nitrate, and here is a deionized water sample that does not contain nitrate. So you can see that it's this little part of the spectrum here that we're working with that we have to use to tease out the nitrate values. So there's lots going on in these spectra besides just NO3. <clears throat> So I mentioned earlier that calibrations are done in either freshwater or seawater, and you, uh, you're, you should not mix the two. Um, seawater in particular, the spectrum is very different from fresh natural waters, and if you try to mix them up, you'll get erroneous nitrate values. So, however, if, you, if your uh, SUNA is calibrated for seawater, which which involves measuring a, a seawater blank, then you can tell the SUNA that you're working in fresh water and it also is part of the process. Remember our reference spectra that we talked about a few minutes ago. There's also a deionized water spectrum too. And so you can, a, a seawater calibrated SUNA can operate in fresh water. However, if you've not done the seawater blank, then you can't use your SUNA in salt water. And for seawater, you do a deionized blank, a low nitrate seawater, hopefully zero nitrate, and then the standard solution that you make up by spiking your, uh, your blank, your low nutrient seawater. <clears throat> for fresh water, we skip this part, and we make a deionized water blank and then a nitrate standard solution also in deionized water. So it's really a matrix difference that we're working with. <clears throat> um, low nutrient seawater means less, less than a tenth of a micromole per liter, which is about near the, the resolution of the SUNA, and so you don't have to hit it exactly zero, which is very hard to do with seawater. We use, uh, in calibration, we use water collected in the North Pacific offshore of Hawaii, and so it's an oligotrophic area that is very low nitrate, our samples typically test out at below uh, one micromole per liter of, uh, of nitrate and nitrite. And so here is the spectra of all three, the deionized water, the seawater, and then the, the uh, spiked seawater standard here. And so you can see that's the part of the spectrum that we work in, and that's the difference between deionized water low nutrient seawater and a uh, 40 micromole per liter seawater standard. Just to show you how we do it, this is our system that we've set up at Seabird. And this is a temperature controlled bath that's large enough to hold a couple of sunas. <clears throat> There's a recirculating chiller to keep the temperature constant, the computers that log the data, and then here is a peristaltic pump, and here is your, your reservoirs for either for blanks and for standards. Now, if you decide to tackle this yourself, make sure that you keep all of your working solutions in glass. Remember, I told you that the plastic bottles will leach out uh, dissolved organic matter, and they will bring your blank up because of the absorption of that, of that water. So we have a, a sample cell that we can insert in the SUNA. It's got an O-ring here that fits exactly over the window. And so there's a peristaltic pump, the working solutions, and they're pumped into the temperature-controlled tank. 
and then you can flush the cell, take a reading. If you don't like your reading, you can flush it again as, and repeat until you get a good calibration. Here's the certificate that, you, that we <clears throat> print out and send with each, with each uh, SUNA. And the calibration depends on temperature, which is noted here, optical path length, and then integration period. So it's a good idea to choose an integration period that matches the calibration that we've done for you. So here, this one is 200 uh, frames. So that's 200 spectral scans. And uh, then there's the conditions, blank solutions, standards, concentrations, and then the data files that are stored that are used to create the certificate. And then here's the example spectra with the deionized water blank, seawater blank, and then the seawater standard. <coughs> In addition to those, to the spectral plot and the, the other conditions of calibration, there's two plots that are included. There's a total absorbance of the, of the system with seawater and, and nitrate. And this is, and there's also extinction coefficient uh, between the, uh, the various solutions that we provide. And the reason that these are included in your calibration files is it, it shows the quality of the calibration. Uh, we, this is how we judge whether we need to repeat the calibration as we look at these, these plots. And if they don't have well-formed in-family uh, traces, then you repeat the calibration. And the reason that you might not get a good calibration are the same reasons that you might struggle with your reference measurement that we talked about a few minutes ago. And that's bubbles, uh, dirty window, or also incomplete mixing of, this, of the sample solutions in the cell. The, the instrument is placed in the bath with the, the calibration cell in place, and then you pump solutions of, you pump deionized water in, and you flush it with seawater to get that blank, and then you flush it with your, your higher concentration standard. And so there's, there's flushing issues too, and then also leaks that let the bath water into the cell. So here's a little bit of the, the first five, well not the first, this, these are the uh, middle five lines of the, of the calibration file and the, there's some nomenclature involved. Uh, lines that begin with an H are headers and this, this particular header has simply the column labels of the data underneath it. Uh, above that there are call outs for the calibration conditions and some other information, some bookkeeping information. And then following that are, uh, are spectra. So these are the absorbance, these are the detector counts measured at each spectrophotometer channel. And so I mentioned earlier that this is a 256 channel spectrophotometer. And so each one of these numbers here is indicative of the, uh, of the absorbance at that particular channel. And so this runs from, in our case, from about 208 nanometers up to, well, 256 plus that. So that's 400 something. Um, so the, the first column is the wavelength of each of these bins and this is supplied by the spectrophotometer manufacturer and the actual number here is going to vary spectrophotometer to spectrophotometer. It doesn't impact our analysis, but if you look at these files and you note that there are different bins for this, it's because of uh, just the, the, the uh, calibration of the spectrophotometer's bins by Zeiss, and so that's why you would see some different. Um, then nitrate, which is the molar absorptivity of the uh, nitrate in liters per micromoles per path length. So these are for a half centimeter or a one centimeter path. And then there's the seawater blank. So this is, this is your high standard. This is your seawater blank here, and that's zero nitrate. Uh, we don't use this channel. This is, is a temperature compensation channel that we're 
currently not using. And then finally, the last column is the dark counts. So this is with the lamp off and shows you what the response of the detector is with no light shining on it. So step one is, so this is when I say step one, we're, we're calculating nitrate now. So we're working our way through the process to come up with a nitrate number given the spectra that we've measured. So also, uh, to make things a little simpler for the screen, I have given you equations that are only written for one bin. And so these, this, uh, the math that we're going to work our way through is done for each bin in the spectrum. Uh, if, if you were to do the entire spectrum, you'd do 256 of them, which we will, which the SUNA does, but the nitrate calculation is only performed on a small section of that spectrum from 217 nanometers up to about 240. So even though I don't have a little parentheses and an N in there to indicate bin number, remember that this is done for each bin in the spectra that we're working on. So the first thing that you do is you convert uh, detector counts <clears throat> into absorbance at each wavelength. So that's the equation. So here, this is the detector counts for a particular wavelength or bin. This is the dark counts for that bin. And then this is your deionized water blank counts that you measured, either your reference spectra or one that we measured at the factory. And then this is the dark counts for that set of bins measured at that time. So the calibration file contains this information, the uh, deionized blank minus the dark counts. And so that's essentially done for you in using, the, in using that file. Um, also recall that the dark counts are measured periodically as you collect data. For time series data, you get a dark count and then you get a sample count. If you're collecting profiles with uh, uh, a CTD, then you get a block of sample spectra and then uh, three um, dark count measurements and then a block of spectral data and a block and three dark count measurements and a block of spectral data. So it's, it's, they're interleaved in each case. The reason to measure dark counts as you are, are working along is that dark counts depend on the temperature of the detector. And so uh, particularly for profiling, it's important to keep track of dark counts, perhaps less so for, for uh, time series moorings where the temperature is not changing a lot, but just because since you can't, since we can't know the conditions of your work, we measure the dark count each time we measure a time series value so that you do have that for the temperature that you're working out. So then step number two is uh, removing the effect of bromide and sea salts for each channel. So remember that, that rather uh, busy plot that showed the absorbance of all of the different species, ionic species that absorb in our uh, spectral area in seawater, and the two that are, well, the, the one that is really most uh, difficult to take care of is the bromide absorbance. So we have models of bromide absorbance, and you calculate what that would be by knowing what the salinity and temperature is of the water that you're working, working in. So here is the, the extinction coefficient of your sample in seawater is equal to the extinction coefficient of nitrate in seawater, which we measured in our calibration. And then there's the function that scales this depending upon the, uh, the uh, temperature of the water that you're working in. So here's the equation. These coefficients have been determined by the, uh, the fellow who developed the SUNA nitrate sensor, Ken Johnson at Ambari, and these constants are simply uh, constants that you can find in the, in the manual and in the uh, calibration file. And then there's wavelength minus offset. So the offset is, is given us by the manufacturer 
of the spectrophotometer and then the wavelengths of each bin is found in the calibration file. <coughs> so that is what you use to, to take away the absorbance by bromine. So then once you have done that, here's extinction of seawater that you see that we calculated based upon the temperature and the coefficients we know. And then here is your corrected nitrate absorbance, the uh, absorbance of zero nitrate seawater, which we measure in calibration, and then the extinction of seawater, and then p sal is the practical salinity. So as I said, it depends on temperature and salinity. The correction is done in a two-step process, one for temperature and the next step for salinity. <clears throat> and then finally, we use a multiple linear regression least squares fit to solve this equation. So the corrected nitrate absorbance is equal to the simply the baseline slope and intercept, which are uh, calibration values, and then there's the wavelength plus the molar nitrate times the extinction of nitrate. So that's the number you want there, and so you use least squares uh, to solve this equation for that number. It's Because it's multivariate, it's not a simple slope and an offset, but it is a Two, a couple of slopes, that's the multivariate part, and so one of them, rather than, than x equals a plus by, you have a, x equals a plus by plus c, z, and so you, have, you solve it for a multivariate system, and that's the number you want there. Again, that solution, if you want to do your own, um, you can find uh, code available from various sources that will give you that, that statistical process, or you can, can use the one that is built into uh, the software that's provided with Asuna, and it is simply a, a multivariate analysis. <clears throat> so here's what the data file looks like for a time series. And I mentioned earlier that data is stored as comma-separated values, so you can look at them in Excel, uh, they're easy to handle, and each line could, starts out with an instrument identifier, and there's the, se there's the serial number of the particular SUNA that we're looking at, and then there's a, uh, a dark count that you see here, starts off with all zeros, and then there's the, the, the detector counts continues off. There's 256 uh, entries on this line, and so it extends far off, in, off the screen here, but um, the first line's dark counts, and then the second line is, is sample spectra, and that continues off in this direction. And then, as I said before, if you're profiling, you would get a block of sample scan spectra, and then a set of zeros repeating as you, as you go down your data set. Um, interfering substances, We've, I've mentioned this several times as well, so there are two things that can interfere with a measurement, uh, either uh, UV absorbing substances or also particles that scatter light. Uh, and these cause the SUNA to report a higher than expected nitrate value. This is, a, if, if you are working in waters that have high organic matter or a lot of particles, then it is particularly helpful if you collect discrete samples so that you can get an idea of the contribution of these interfering substances in your n calculated nitrate. And so we uh, made a plot that you see here using fulvic acid, which is a common organic present in natural waters, and each one of these lines is a, is a, a different concentration of fulvic acid, and so you can see as the concentration of fulvic acid goes up, so does the absorbance that will be present in your spectrum as a, as a background value. And here's a table of, of, that estimates what the error would be under certain conditions. So we've tested it for particles with Arizona road dust, kale and powder, 
titanium dioxide. Uh, here's the turbidity units of the test, the absorbance, and the predicted uh, error in nitrate for those particular conditions. So in the case of, of low concentrations of particles, it's pretty low. It, of course, as you would expect, as the concentration goes up, your nitrate error also goes up. Uh, it is more, the, the CDOM is a bigger problem than turbidity is, and so here's different uh, compounds that are found in natural waters from Pony Lake and the, and the Suwannee River and the Pahokee peat humic acid. <laughs> and so here's their absorbances, the anticipated uh, error that you might see. So for, for some, it's up to uh, as much as almost half of a, of a milligram per liter. I'm sorry, a, a micromole per liter. So it, it can be significant, but it's, it's not a huge interfere. -er. Um, <clears throat> so what can you do about it? Well, CDOM uh, very often is actually also fluorescent, which we term FDOM, but you can measure this directly. Uh, you can use a, a uh, eco sensor to measure this. Uh, you can also look at wavelengths that are outside of the absorbance band that we use to calculate nitrate. And so the sooner reports two other channels in your data file, one at 350 nanometers and one at 254 nanometers. And recall the spectrum, the section of the spectrum that we use is 217 to 240. And so these are outside of the, of the main absorbance of nitrate and can give you an indication of, of uh, CDOM that might be present. Uh, the data example that I have coming up does have something that appears to be interference by CDOM, and so I'll, we'll take a look at these channels. I'm not real confident in the, in the effectiveness of this, but it's still something that's, that's worth looking at and talking about. If you're working in very high absorbance waters, like greater than 1.3 absorbance units, um, then the soon is just flat not going to work because it's not going to be able to project enough light through your sample in order to get a, a good reading. And so that, that condition, it doesn't matter whether it's CDOM or turbidity. If it's, if it's too, too dense, then you're just not going to be able to beam light through it. In addition, uh, there is a pressure adjustment if you are, are profiling or if you are working in deep water. So this is, is proposed by a, uh, a fellow working at, at LOV in Nice, France, and his estimate of this is the extinction of seawater will change by uh, a factor, a multiplicative factor, and for his work in the Mediterranean, it, F here, this factor is about 2%, or 0 0.02 per 1,000 decibars. Uh, the, if you read the paper, they will suggest that you, that you should try to determine F for your own natural waters, which is... Uh, which you would do from, from discrete samples. But uh, note that, that this is a, it really isn't something that you have to worry about until you get down around 1,000 decibars because it is scaled to 1,000 decibars. So if you're working in the surface ocean, which is nitrate of most interest to people, um, this is probably not an adjustment that you'll need to make. But you should still be aware that, that it is there. Um, and then finally, here are the references that, that uh, I use to prepare the workshop, and this provides background information as to how the calculations are, are arrived at um, and all of the other, other work that went into this to, to produce a sensor that you can use in seawater. All right, next up is a data example. And uh, we're going to look at some work in Puget Sound because that's where Seabird is and that's where most of our, our local friends are. Um, so in this example, we have data from, that was collected by our local, at least local to Seabird, county government. And they have a regular monitoring program uh, in Puget Sound. And one of the parameters that they are 
are including in their monitoring is uh, student nitrate. And they use a, uh, a CTD and collect profiles. They use an SB25 plus and collect profiles in real time. That's a picture of their new boat, which I think is a pretty nice boat. And then here's a reference to, uh, to the local government and a link to their, to their source of this material. So here's where we're working. Um, there's, let's see, let me orient myself, okay. So Seabird is right about here. Seattle, this is the Seattle area. And this is Puget Sound in the inland waters. They work all the way down into Hood Canal. It's, it's actually quite a bit larger data set than the part that we're gonna talk about. And uh, Deep Brightwater is our largest treatment plant here. And it comes, makes, uh, uh, has an outfall up in this area no, I'm sorry, up in, we're here, up in here. And so we have an example from, uh, of, of possible CDOM contamination in this, this one, a deep station, and then they also work all the way up into this river, which is a dredged river that has a, quite a profound industrial presence. Um, and, but it provides a, a freshwater lens and then a seawater uh, layer below, the typical salt wedge. And the salt wedge goes up to as much as 10 kilometers from Puget Sound, so it's, it's quite a substantial tidal change. So here's what the profiles look like, and this one is, is a deep water station right in the middle of the sound, and so you can see there's temperature, salinity, and then here are the nitrate values. So they are fortunate to have a nutrient laboratory as part of their, their uh, installation. And so uh, Stephanie, the woman who was out collecting this data, uh, got discrete samples to go along with all of her nitrate profiles. And so what you see here is the blue dots are the raw SUNA nitrate collected throughout the profile. This, in addition, is up and down cast as well. So it's not just half the profile, but it's, it's all the way up. And then here, the pink diamonds are her, uh, her discrete samples. And then she's got a couple of, of different fitting routines to, to turn the blue dots into a nitrate profile. And so what you can see is we have pretty good agreement. The nitrate values are expressed in milligrams per liter. And so we're probably hitting the discrete samples, I would say about plus or minus 0.5 is a pretty good uh, it's a pretty good uh, air bar, except for the very surface where the, the uh, salinity drops off quite rapidly. And you can see we missed, we missed up here in the surface reporting high of correct. And that's probably uh, an error in the, in the correction model for bromine. And uh, so as, as you recall, that that bromine correction depended upon temperature and salinity, and so it may not be perfect as you, as you take a dive into lower salinity. But still, pretty good agreement all in all. Here it is blown up, and so you can see that we were high up correct down here in the deeper water. We hit the mark pretty well as salinity started changing. Up in this part, we started to miss a little more and then up at the very surface, we're, we're reporting high. Yes? Well, it's raw data in the sense of it's, it's calculated nitrate that has not been uh, offset or slope adjusted from the discrete samples. Right, it has all of, the, all of the corrections that I ran through are present and to get nitrate, but they, she didn't take the next step, which would be using the discrete samples to correct the profile. So it, we're, we're showing how good or bad we are. And then um, this is the one up near the outfall of the large treatment plant, and it's further, uh, further um, oceanward going north in Puget Sound, and so you get a little less uh, freshwater signal in the top of the of the profile, 
but, and it's fairly uniform as you come down. And so you see something very similar to the last, the last uh, plot where we do pretty well here through the middle of the water column. We hit the mark better because the salinity isn't changing quite as rapidly and temperature is not changing quite as rapidly. And so our surface point is a little better than the last, the last cast. However, down at the bottom of the, of the profile, you can see that the SUNA is reporting anomalously high nitrate values compared to the discrete sample that you see here. Um, the anomalous value being about a tenth of a milligram per liter higher than the, than the surrounding areas. So, um, the woman that collected this data was, was uh, very curious about this and she wondered if this was not a CDOM signal because in addition to the, the chemical parameters and the CTD parameters that they collect, they also do biological sampling and they have observed uh, large blooms of larvaceans in this area. There's a picture of a larvaceae uh, that you can see. If you're not familiar with these, this is a, a small creature about the size of a pea that exudes uh, mucus and collects particles on the mucus and then reels in the particles from the mucus that surrounds it. And so, as you might imagine, that's a very organic matter uh, creature, and so it puts a lot of dissolved organic matter into the water column. Um, whether this is true or not is, is supposition, but if you look at the blue dots down here, you can see that, that at the bottom, the nitrate sample, the variation in the nitrate sample went up dramatically. And so she's wondering if we're not seeing, uh, could be particles from the larvaceans, pieces of their, of their uh, mucus surrounding, it could be uh, just the dissolved matter, it's, it's hard to tell. And so another question is, well, did you just hit the bottom with a CTD and a big puff of, of sediment came up and that's what's causing it? Uh, but if that were the case, then we would expect here down at the bottom where uh, if you did hit the bottom that you would see the salinity change dramatically as those particles came up and were sucked into the system. And although we do see something down here, uh, it's not quite as, as dramatic as we might expect had we hit the bottom. But that's also a third possibility is that it's merely sediment particles that have come up when the, the sampling package hit the bottom and disturbed it. But you see that on the downcast as well. Right. But so it would come down, bump the bottom and nitrate. Oh. Shows the yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's suggestion in the literature that the absorption at 254 and 350 could is an indicator of CDOM uh, absorbance, and so I I plotted these uh, these spectra these spectra for the profile. And uh, what you see here is not entirely satisfying. It's, there is, this is upcast and downcast, and so you can see that there's some hysteresis or separation here, but uh, it's hard to say definitively that, that we are observing an absorbance in this area, and it is CDOM. It looks perhaps more likely, as Ian suggested, that there's that there's larvaceans floating around and come into the sample path and go out, and that's why we, why we saw a little more of the, uh, of the absorbance there. And then finally, we have a strongly freshwater influence station that is, that is at the mouth of the, of the Duwamish River, which is, uh, the Duwamish River runs through a large industrial section of, of South Seattle. It's actually a Superfund site. Um, but it does have a strong salt wedge that goes as far as 10 kilometers upriver. And so for this one, you can see the salinity is at the bottom of the station, which is about 9 meters, is typical 
uh, Puget Sound salinity of 28 and then uh, goes up very rapidly almost all the way down to, to brackish water at about 6 PSU. However, the temperature profile remains fairly constant. And so this data is, that I presented has been calculated, but the correction for salinity that was step three in the process has been omitted to illustrate what the effect of salinity on the, on the nitrate calculation is. And so there's the top of the profile and the bottom of the profile. So we have, we're overestimating a bit and underestimating. However, our scale's rather large here. So if we blow it up, you can see that in these conditions, without that correction, we significantly overestimate what the, uh, what the nitrate concentration is. And here, the sensor is working in saltwater mode, so it's applying the, the uh, calibration information for saltwater that is stored on board. However, we're at 6 PSU, we're getting really close to freshwater, and so that's the, that's the error that you see here. And then here, we're overestimating a bit as well. But there's also quite a bit of scatter in this data. So it's hard to say that we're really overestimating when you see this much scatter. Again, it's a, it's a, a river coming down and hitting Puget Sound, so there's a lot of chemistry going on as well. But at, at the very least, it gives us an uncertainty range. Yes, it does. It, it shows you the variation and also the, the uh, impact of the salinity correction. So that's the end of the workshop.